Right, this is going to be another episode of Counterpoints with me and Maniac. And of course, we are going to talk about the major because, I mean, it'd be pretty mad to actually do like it. I mean, to be fair, technically, in a way, Talking Counter did do like a whole episode that was just like about Major's life that wasn't really about the major. Uh, obviously, that, the problem there is a major with a three or major the major, Peter mm. Copenhagen. But to be fair, that podcast is already more about things like getting someone on and just going into their past, sort of like half interview, isn't it? Well, I could make... Here's the thing. As the best interviewer ever in the history of esports, I can make this joke, which is, it's sort of like an interview, but if you just let Chad sit in the room and then die, like uh, just every now and then just like short circuit the interview and, you know, mess up the question you must ask, or just ask a really long question that they don't answer, because if you don't know, guys, when I ask all those extra parts of my question, those are all off-ramps the person can take. But if you want them to take a specific one, you have to limit it or return with a follow-up question. So all I'll say if you Chad is just use follow ups, mate. Just have a notepad, and when they don't address the part you wanted, don't go, Oh, well, gave him a chat. You just go back to the notepad, and you'll go back to that point, you'll be able to get it back. There's a little, in fact, there's, that's actually worth millions. That little tip I just gave there, but no one will do it as usual. So, the first thing I actually just want to know, Maniac, is obviously we're going to talk about PGL Copenhagen. Just first things first, you're obviously at the event. What, what have you thought so far? What's it been like for you? Um, I would say it's, it's been great. Um, I had this little bit of an issue because we we ended. The major elimination stage on that whole G two VP, the oh, crash of Jade, and I feel like right. it's it really yeah. Right. From like a recency bias, I had I struggled to kind of distance myself from sure. it. But then if I do the exercise and I really try to take a little bit of distance, I would say that this have been eight great days, honestly. And the playoffs list that we end up with is wonderful. It's freaking perfect. I don't even oh, think I would have another yeah. team being in it if I could. So I would say that the Counter-Strike has delivered. Um, there's been obviously a few ups and downs with a couple of teams. But from a broadcast perspective, things went relatively smooth. Um, no major issue. Again, that's aside the, the Jane crash, which really tainted the whole situation. So it's been a great week for me. And the vibe is really good. We're all here in the same hotel, right? So you get to hang out with the players and the crew um, every evening or something at the hotel lobby or stuff like that. So it's been a very positive experience so far. I have to say, even though I failed the Pick'em Challenge, this is why actually, Maniac, I'm extra salty. Because my actual gamble in the Pick'ems was to say G2 wouldn't make it. And guess which team I had making it? Fertis Pro. So you can imagine, I was actually <laughs> on full bar tilt. I've even told the story. I was actually <laughs> traveling on a train during Map 2 Maniac. And so the joke, I've told the story on Hot Talk Point Red. I actually thought, oh, it's the train internet. That's why he's like suddenly like teleported from outside that box into the open. Like, <laughs> There's no way he'd do that. I just thought he's done like a weird peak I've missed or something. So when I actually then rewound it on the YouTube, I was like, Fuck, because I already thought like, oh, no. look, here's the thing I will say. It, if the, if indeed what they claim in the G2 camp, which is that Hooksy was doing essentially the classic Inferno save, which goes, you let the first guy try to get the kill. If he gets the kill, it's not a save. But if he doesn't, you just pull back and the three people save the guns. If that is true, that story, that, that is what the call was, then... Obviously, it's not as simple as people think because if people think G2 was going for the retake, I do think VP, if the crash doesn't happen, have a very good chance to win that retake. They have all the power positions and the guy with the AWP is in the best spot you can be in pretty much. It doesn't have to show. But even so, the problem you have is this, guys. If G2 had forced the retake and lost it, then yes, they'd be busted on the last round and VP would probably win the map and it would be 2-0. But the issue is, I'll give, I will give. I won't say Huxley's lying. I don't think so. Inferno's a classic map when you're locked out B site with smokes to rotate off. If it's indeed true that G2 was going to save the three guns anyway, then the last round still would have been like an actual real five on five gun round. So you would have still had to earn it if you were VP. You didn't just off that one round necessarily win the series. So it's not quite as simple as when people are like, they got stolen from making the playoffs. They got stolen from a very yeah. good chance to make the playoffs. But the other issue as well is, and this is the one thing that tortures me a bit, is obviously it does make it easier to accept on some level that it was a blowout on the third map. That makes you think, Oh, well, okay, fair enough, G2 might be better. But I will just put this in there. You were a competitor. If you do lose in that fashion, and where essentially we all know it's unfair, it's just that there's no actual fair solution, and we don't have the tech to rerun the round in that exact chrono break League of Legends style, it, then essentially you can't really actually know that that third map is how it would have played out, even if G2 had won without the crash. No. You know what I mean? Because I always think we do do that as analysts. We do act like each map is independent, which it is in a way, but there is also obviously the psychological mindset you go into that last map with. And even though we might all say, 
say, oh, James, so calm and cool. Yeah, but I don't know that everyone in VP is. Maybe some of them were on full bar tilt. I was on the train, mouthing out my mind in the Netherlands. So, well, well, give me some thoughts on this moment then. Come no, on, give me your take. Uh, listen, I, I, I'm, with you. I'm with you on that. Um, but for, it's, it's a very complicated situation. But first of all, I, I agree with you. I think some or a lot of people are very unreasonable with what should have happened or could have happened if the crash didn't. And I think it's much more complicated than just saying, ah, oh, that was going to be a 13-11 yes, VP. Absolutely. Uh, there's much more intricacies to that. But what I will agree to and, and what I also try to convey on social media, maybe I didn't do it the right way, but just it is so almost impossible for VP to enter the third map with a fresh mindset course, and a positive mindset. Like it is almost, it's, it's just impossible. Yes. And at that point... It's, it, I think it's it's not about saying, hey, it's there's no way they're going to win the third map because who knows, uh, chain of event, pistol round one into first gun round, suddenly you pick up a little bit of steam and then you can manage to like manufacture a bit of momentum. But it's just that VP are already so mentally weak at the start of map three that only a, li a little pinch, like a little, a little, little hit in, in the shoulder is going to make them tumble. So it was really freaking deflating. And the fact that the third map is such a whitewash is like, oh, please. Like, we all know we all know what's happening. And we all know what's going on right there. Um, at the same time, I feel like, as you said, it is a, it's, it's a complicated situation because it is incredibly unfair for VP what happened and the context of when it happened. But also, the rules were applied. So I almost feel like we're like, we're like this yes. very extremely exceptional, exceptional scenario where maybe the rules just aren't fitting to the situation but it's a super like it's like a pandora box if you start opening the the door of ah oh, you know what maybe in this case we shouldn't follow the rules like wait a minute so so what are you telling me you're telling me that we have to qualitatively analyze every single round to know when a decision has to be made it's i know we would all love to be able to do that but the truth is in, in actuality it's almost impossible to do so it's infuriating to watch but you sort of have to admit that yeah i guess the rules were followed but that doesn't take any any pain away from VP, and it doesn't take away the fact that it looked like they were looking at a 2-0, and they were probably the better team in that game until the moment of the crash. So it's just emotionally pretty deflating. Um, but if you're G2, hey, what are you going to do? You're going to seize the chance. Like There's an opportunity right there. You, you go on that third map, you beat the shit out of them, and you go into the playoff where nobody really expected you at that point. So, you know, I don't know. I think it's just a pretty sad event. And I think it's really... Uh, on top of that, what I said is that it happened at the end. So it's like it colored unfairly the, the end of the elimination stage, which I think ran pretty smoothly up until then and had cool stories. Well, now, hopefully, as we enter the playoff, then we can start focusing on, uh, on the most exciting uh, side of it. Um, one thing I would just quickly say is, one... If people don't know, as Maniac just stressed there, I went out of my way on Hot Take Point Mate to make this point because I was actually recording that the night of the thing happened. So I knew everyone's going to watch it and go mental. One thing I want people to understand is PGL absolutely followed not only the rules, but the rules that all big town straight. If this was an ESL event, you're all going to tell me, like I would agree, ESL runs the best events. ESL would have had the same ruling, I can tell you right now, because the way the rule in is interpreted, quite crucially, is this. It's not... Did like a lot of people know the first part, which is was damage done, but that's not it actually. Like there was a famous example brought up from I think it was um, I can't remember if it was Pro League or something. It was that match that basically where you had Fnatic played outsiders, fully enough, it's Pro, I think. And there was a round where like, it might even have been IM Rio, where like all three Fnatic players dropped from the server in like a 3v3. Now, the key thing is there's a slight different interpretation of the rule, which you just have to know if you haven't watched the other show, which goes like this. Traditionally, it was damage done. If damage is done, the round plays out. It doesn't matter if you crash. It doesn't matter if a guy drops, etc. But in that scenario for Fnatic specifically, there's like a bracket, there's a parenthesis on the rule and it says something like, like that the, the round continues, like as something along the lines of like, essentially, if there's still like a way for the team that's been affected by the crash to win. So if they have people alive, if they have people still in the round, then it continues. So the reason why for the Fnatic one, it actually was replayed. If you ever go back and look, it's cause all three of them dropped from the server. So there was no way their team could have won the round. Essentially, the, the crash did take the round from them. The problem with the VP one is, even if you're the biggest VP fan in the world, yes, that was a very, very key player in a very strong position, but it still wasn't like the round was over. G2 still had to frag, they still had to come into the site, still had to coordinate. You still could have won the round if you were VP. And by the way, I'll just point this out because I think it's the only way to be fair is I always do this, Maniac, because I come from the world of philosophy where you understand your principles and then you apply them to the scenario. If VP had still 
won that round, guys. And at the end, they win in the clutch. And like maybe the guy like on the bomb spot, or whatever, kills two people. Would all you VP fans say, hey, there was a crash earlier. Restart the round. No, of course you wouldn't. You'd go, the crash sucks, but the result should stand because we won the round. So even though, as I said at the outset, it is unfair to everyone on some level. I mean, you could argue it's not to G2 because nothing happened to them and they got to win the round. But if you'd have done any other measure, like restart the round, it would have been in some sense unfair to them. Unfortunately, right now, this is all we can do. There's a reason why that rule mm. has existed. The whole time Maniac was a pro player, it's because essentially when we run lands and we're not doing like a sports event where we can just cancel it and come back and play the whole thing, another day we have time considerations we also know these things are going to happen a lot by the way in online qualifiers with like thousand team brackets we've made these rules to get most instances and be as fair as we can I will say you did bring up one minor thing there that I'd maybe just stay food for thought we'd have to get into it now the one angle I'd maybe throw in is most crashes don't usually decide who wins the map or the game they're just around and it's like look we've actually been pretty lucky with crashes in Couch Strike history I'll even say guys like we've never had it happen in a major final for example there's never been a guy in a 1v2 where one of the other ones just dies and it becomes a 1v1 and he wins it easily. Luckily, that's never happened. We've never had the nightmare scenario where a crash did sort of like to this extent decide a game. So I would say the one maybe consideration you could do would be something like I know that in some sports where they gradually introduced like video refereeing, for example, the ability to review like a play in the NBA, did that shot come off before the buzzer went? There are certain scenarios where you can't review every play, maybe. Like, I can't just say, hey, that wasn't, like, that was the bullshit what you did there. Like, but if it's like one to decide a quarter or a half, it's like something at the end of a game like this, then you could maybe make the debate. Maybe that should have a different s system of review yeah, or maybe. a different set of rules. But again, I'd say that's more food for thought. We're not going to figure that out in five minutes here, spitballing. That's actually, believe it, not, not even something for me made it. that's for the admins that's for that like Michael guy who Polish guy from ESL the ones who've done admining for like 10 years I'd trust them to know what's possible and what you could implement if there was better tech even that thing I suggested of have a League of Legends style chrono break where you can start the game from the perfect scenario look I would actually prefer that over not do anything but even then I will admit the problem with Counter Strike is it's inherently an information game so if you already do know all the positions everyone had which we all would restart you you will never actually be able to get that round back it'll just be a different round yeah, and can. then we see who wins the other round so that's why I say there's no real fair scenario you just have to essentially pick what are you picking in this case what they're picking and I'll just say this last thing so if you're a VP fan you can calm down and enjoy the rest of the episode is understand the reason why in a way this rule is fair is because if it had actually been G2 that had crashed like this they would have gotten fucked by it so do you understand it wasn't like this was it wasn't like someone from PGL went like King Solomon like I will decide who is the correct person I choose v G no one from G PGL chose anyone they just applied the rules to the situation and unfortunately in this case it just happened VP didn't make it I'll spin that into this one thing to say this maniac which is this actually is almost a dream bracket for me because if I actually look if we ignore the three zeros and three twos I pick seven of these eight teams to be in the playoffs maniac it's only eternal fire I didn't obviously I gambled on the VP angle instead and obviously I have my own reasons for not liking eternal fire that much but aside from that like if you're going to get seven out of the eight teams I want one more, I can only ask for one more. That's a pretty banging bracket. And you look at it. We've got like, even this angle, let's just start here, Maniac. I even think a cool angle people aren't realizing because of how much parity is in World Cup Strike if you're not Team Spirit is, you know, normally I would bitch about this bracket in one way. I would go... The top side's too overloaded. Look at it, all the teams that should mm. win in the top. Mate, I can't even say that right now. Right now, Fears and Vitality might not win an event. Right now, maybe Mouse can blow everyone of it. Maybe Na'Vi actually is the truth. And they're, they're peaking now and Blade's going to be a genius and win without simple. I actually look at this bracket. Look, I will say, if you're the teams in the bottom half, the Mouse G2, Eternal Fire Na'Vi, I will say you should all be incredibly empowered that like, hey, all of us could be in the final. There is that. But even so, I think what I've learned about this tournament so far is unless you are team spirit, and by the way, I've never seen them play with this lineup in a playoff. You're, every other team, all bets are off, mate. What's great is this is actually Counter-Strike Minic. It isn't like going in the old days where if you just knew the map pool, you knew who was going to win that series 2-1. You knew this team has better players. Right now, I actually think the parity is amazing. This playoffs could be really exciting. Yeah. No, I, I'm right there with you. Um, I, I really think, looking at the quarterfinals, I wouldn't even be able to point to one and tell you that I think the result is obvious. Like yes. there's no quarterfinal where I can. Oh, make everything's a, a winnable. State. Yeah, everything's winnable. Yeah, everything is open. Also because I think, beautifully enough, for some of the lineups that haven't exactly performed to the very best at group stage, and I have vitality and phase in mind. We all know that 
there is a very high chance that they will perform yes. much better now that we are entering the realm of a stage and a, a major playoff. Uh, and that rules or that philosophy kind of applies in the other way around for Spirit, which is for two of these players, a uh, first time playoff stage. So we're still not playoff stage, but at the major, right? So there's so many different ways you can look at this bracket and sort of start building whatever narratives could happen. I, I have a feeling that the winner still belongs in the top part of it. Sure. Because I, I, sure. I, if, I, if I'm building the case, the, on, <laughs> the only real case that I can make for the bottom bracket holding the winner currently is that G2 would enter in sort of a Cologne-like trance sure. where they just you know take off for some crazy reason and then they become the untamable beast of the stage. That's all. Because I personally have Miles over G2. I just think if you compare the Counter Strike well. at this very moment, Miles is a better, stronger team right now, and it's not just individual; it's the, the Counter Strike in general is just, just better. But then, if you tell me, okay, Maniac, now the final is going to be Miles face. You think Miles is going to win? I would say, oof, ooh, I, I don't okay. really know. Actually, yeah, face yeah. beat them all the time, so that that's my problem. I feel like my my strongest contender in the bottom half of the bracket is Miles, but I wouldn't give them the favor against almost none of the teams that are at the top brackets. And th that's the angle that I'm going with. I don't know who from the top bracket is going to be there, but I feel like almost anyone would have my favors over Maus. And that's what makes it beautiful as well, because for Maus to make sort of the final step or the next step, however you want to name it, would be to make it all the way... Well, I mean, I think starting by beating G2 in the quarterfinal would be decent, but still would be to make it all the way to the grand final and then beat like an ogre of a team in the final of the major. And this, this would be like the most impressive and incredible way to to mark that step for them so yeah i have plenty of different stories in my head that i go through when i'm looking at this bracket i've got the segue though because i know where we need to start and this is the, an important topic and you give me the segue perfectly because even though i agree maniac in a way you are cheating because here's why take spirit out of the top half and you can pick any of the four teams and put them in there all of a sudden, you wouldn't say that about the bottom half. The real problem is this. Spirit is doing a lot of heavy lifting in that top half of the bracket. I know the names of Vitality and Fears are obviously huge. But, mate, the problem is this. I've looked at almost everyone's pick and video. Bro, I think everyone thinks Spirit is winning this major. I even said it on Twitter. Bro, I don't do this. People will know this. One of the reasons why I rode with Fears for so many tournaments they didn't win last year is I nearly always bank on the team that's elite and has the experience advantage. I do think experience advantage is a massive factor in this game. I even normally, mm. by the way, also give a lot of credit to IGLs. I think when you're in pressure matches, the IGL can make the game-winning play. Actually, in a way that it's underrated because everyone can see if the star player makes the game-winning play. But people do underrate how good the good IGLs are under pressure the problem is even though i'm not actually a big chopper fan he's obviously never done it before in a massive tournament like this and i like quite frankly normally i would actually stress all the things i did before the kind of it's ones like look they should choke and there's no reason why they can and even if they can win the first <laughs> match you know maybe in the semis the pressure goes up the problem is this maniac if i just look at the counter strike Bro, I've, I've said it on Twitter, I have never seen a team that looks this strong that also didn't have the experience and you had any reason to, to, to doubt. Because essentially, if I take the experience out, I would like I would bet Spirit confidently to win this major. They're just too good, mate. So, I even think the map pool is too crazy. <laughs> I, my, my take on Spirit is that if they win their quarterfinal there's a very high chance they win this major. But I will say, and now that is that is probably a hot take, I think FaZe is going to beat them in the quarterfinal. Ooh, okay. I didn't know you and actually the reason picked... I, okay. the, Did you have no, FaZe winning I, the major I, I then? Did you pick FaZe winning the major? <laughs> no. You picked Mouse no, to win you, the major? You, know what I did. you actually picked Mouse to win the major? You, you know picked Vitality did. the whole way. Sorry, my, my mistake, mate. I forgot I was talking to you. You picked Vitality. Yeah, exactly. Because here's your problem. If... I already know your problem. As an analyst, mate, here's your issue. You, even though right now, for all we know, Zewoo's ill. He doesn't actually have his top form. The problem is, you couldn't live with yourself if he turns up and he is the MVP and he blasts everyone <laughs> and then you picked against him and then they're all there at the after party like, Mathieu, what is going on? You did not pick I, it. I would you, never you, come back from that. No, you can't live with that, can you? I, I, I can't believe I even for a moment thought, Mouse, but no, oh, she's doing no, a listen, match pick. Listen, no, but I, all, all, all of my takes have come like on. caveats. All of my yes, takes have caveats. Course. So. First, the first step, the first step is I think FaZe is going to be spirit because I think that what happened in Katowice, the 3-0 was a little bit of a smoke screen. Sure. I think the second map was extremely tight on a knife's edge on a couple of rounds. And if FaZe managed to push to a third map, I think they, they beat spirit. If it's one-to-one -one scoreline and you, have on that, you arrive on that third map, 
at the major in the playoff, I think that this is where the experience really kicks in, and I think they they beat them. I, I mean, it's, I think it's going to be a huge game, and I acknowledge that there is a world in which Spirit destroy Phase Two Zero. Sure. That I acknowledge sure. that. I know, I know it is a world, but if Phase managed to win one of the two first maps, and if we go to three, I think Phase beat Spirit. That's that's my take. Now for Vitality, I, <laughs> my by the way, that that genuinely makes me think, it. mate. Like you know, like people kept commenting that during like the GM crash, there was some sort of like geomagnetic storm that like hit the Earth or something. It was some like stupid angle like that that people brought up, right? I feel like what it's done is just flipped the, the polarity of this show because why am I picking the underdog? Like, new players that are looking hot and really good. I don't normally do this. Meanwhile, Maniac's just going with like, I'm going to go with experience and the boomerang. We've, we've reversed it. Okay, it's interesting. Go on then, give me the we vitality reversed it. We flipped it. We flipped it. Yes, why is Vitality so, going to What I was going to say is, well, here is the following. If Vitality beat Cloud9, that means, and and it's unconditionally. That means unconditionally that Zaiwu plays better Counter Strike. I don't think Vitality can beat Cloud9 oh, if Zaiwu right. isn't sure. fitting better sure. and yes. pro providing a better Counter Strike that he did. Right? Um, we know the context now. It's been made public. He was fitting like shit, ill. Uh, I think he even had like a medical consultation for a was while. What's the so premise that he had that like a flu really or a cold or something? Is that what it's implied? Uh, really, I think it was a bit more than that. He, what I heard Maybe food from poisoning inside, or was, he was what, what you say? feeding. He was, yeah, exactly. Could have been like a food poisoning or something, right. but he was feeling really, really bad. Okay. Barely slept, barely ate. So, and I mean, if you watch him play uh, the last game against Complexity, you can almost see that he's like borderline delirious, like he's lost in some sure. situation. So, it was it was really rough to watch. Now, I'm going to be optimistic, and I'm going to say that this isn't the side we see here. Sure. Now, if Vitality managed to beat Cloud Nine, now. I, there is no way for me to tell you that they wouldn't be able to beat Spirit or FaZe in a semifinal of a major. They have a good track record against FaZe. They have a good track oh, record. They, they beat yeah. them in some of these situations. So I wouldn't know why I would not give Vitality a chance to beat FaZe. The Spirit one is a little bit more complicated for me in a rational standpoint. I would almost have to take more of like a romantic angle of Zywoo versus Donk and like the crash. Well, the funny like thing the, is what I said last episode. Incredible. We've never seen that matchup. That matchup has never happened yet exactly, with these lineups. Exactly. We've never seen it. Yeah, exactly. But I have less legs to stand on. But in my wicked mind, since I think FaZe is going to beat Spirit, if I imagine this semi-final of FaZe okay. Vitality happening, okay. then I'm ready to say Vitality can beat yes. that. And now if Vitality ends up in the grand final, nobody beats them from the lower bracket, uh, from the bottom part, I mean. If Vitality ends up in the grand final, nobody beats them. There's no team that beats Vitality. Vitality has one of the best records in grand final that there is in recent history oh, of Counter-Strike. Right? Yeah, just a fact. Yeah. They, don't, they don't lose grand finals. They, yes. they won all of them. So I know there's a lot of if and buts, so I'm not just going to stand here and say, oh, no, Vitality is going to win the major, sure. that's for sure. But if the quarterfinals go according to my plan, which is Vitality beating Cloud9 and FaZe edging out Spirit, then I think there's a world. Um, but I'm not going to pretend like it's the, the most logical one or the no, most no. rational one. There is a world in which that happens. No, what I like there is you actually at the end are fully aware that the, like you have actually like fed a little bit of copium for Vitality, which is like... Well, here's the question people would ask is if Vitality wasn't even in the tournament, would Maniac still find a way that FaZe wins the match? That's the obvious question the you know, the the prosecution lawyer would ask. It's like, you know, some would say you're looking for a way FaZe can win that match so that Spirit doesn't have to play Team Vitality, right? In a way? I uh, know. So if I was really honest, I would, I, I guarantee you, if that had nothing to do with Vitality, okay. I would still say okay. FaZe could be okay. Spirit. Here's the thing. I, I, I'm, I'm, being, I'm being genuine I, here. Here's the thing, Minnie. I do think you believe that, but I also think the part of your brain that's the unconscious is what's doing all the heavy lifting on this one and i'll throw this out there i will add this two things one to your credit you did repeatedly stress that this is if zewu is like mvp level form and he's the zewu we all expect then obviously yes i agree by the way i think at that point vitality certainly could win the event but i'll flip it back onto you because the more interesting question is this is let's just say for a moment i my prediction's right and spirit wins that match but it's spirit vitality semi and Zewu turns up. Now that's what I want to know, Maniac, is if real Zewu oh. plays real Donk, what do you think then? What would your thoughts be? Because that's the match I want to see. You're low-key, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm trying to um, articulate my thoughts about that. I think that if real Zewu meets full force Donk, I almost feel like then you would have to look down the lineup to look for like factors. One, do it for me then. No, so so no. how does it shake out elsewhere then? So I would say probably the next name on the list, well, I mean, there's two obvious names, but in, in different ways. But I think if Flames is capable of having games like we've seen recently, that is a huge factor for Vitality. Like his, his entering role is just 
just absolutely needed for sure. Vitality right now. And it sort of hides a different problem, which is in general, Vitality did not play a good Counter-Strike so far at the event. Like it's yes. been pretty messy. The T sides looked a little bit out of identity, out of shape. So they, they've heavily relied on Flames finding some of the entries because whenever Vitality is uh, out of shape or out of source, and then they, I see Zaiwu going in first, uh, sort of peeking impossible angles and giving away his life, I almost want to uh, just absolutely pluck my ass out. So... If Flames showing up, that's the thing. Then you, you need to have Sphinx playing as as one of the five best players in the world. Um, I think his multi kill ability on the city side is very much needed. But shit, um, I would have to do like I in the map pool wise. I'm not really able to articulate right now how it would look like between the two teams. My ancient would be moved. Oh, but they, they take away Inferno, so that kind of sucks. Yeah, basically, actually, I, <laughs> I did run that one in, like, the Ion Technical one. It probably would be something like, maybe like a Mirage Nuke Anubis, if you do Spirit Vitality, I think. Yeah. Something like that. Okay. Yeah, so so I think I think we would almost certainly look look towards the map number three, because I don't think Vitality could handle Mirage yes. against Spirit. I don't think they could. Spirit is just way too strong on it, and Vitality is pretty rusty. Um, I think Vitality might be a little bit more creative on Nuke, and have a little bit more to rely on and then it would all end up on Anubis and yes. I it's been a it's been a minute since I saw Spirit on the map but I still I still think they're pretty excellent so yeah I I think against my heart I might have to side with Spirit against Vitality even if even if we're looking at full force like yeah, yeah. absolute every player is throwing in I think you might have to edge towards Spirit in that one no, but then again I, there are intangibles yeah, coming in like here's how no, I, I would frame say, it like, are, go on there's the intangible so it's about just like the fact that we are the, at a major and whether we like it or not, for some of these players, it is a brand new one. Sure. I know that we did the same thing in Katowice where we said, ah, that's first stage Katowice, let's see what's going to go down. And they absolutely wrecked everybody. So that's already a, a sort of proof of concept that's right there. But what I would like to see is, is Spirit actually being in trouble early on the stage at the major and see what they're made of. I feel like, unfortunately, quote unquote, because I really like that team. Unfortunately, we didn't see that in Katowice. Like their wins were so decisive and like there's, there's no reason for you to feel at any point pressure or lost in the game. You're just basically destroying whoever's in front of you. So well, I, I'm still to see how Spirit reacts losing a map on a big stage, coming back, you know, having that team talk, coming back, sitting down. Um, after all, still a very, very young roster overall. So I'm still looking to see that. What I think makes this a banger if it happens, and by the way, I, if I'd have had my way, these two teams were in the opposite side of the bracket. This could have been the final. Like, I think also, by the way, I do yeah. think if you want Spirit to win and be trapped, look, they have got an amazing draw now where they've got a super legit draw. But also, the, the silliest thing as we're describing here is we actually see probably the quarter of the semis the hardest match they play. They might actually have an easier time in the final, whereas traditionally you want like the mm. final to be the biggest hurdle that you almost have to pull for your world record to get over. And then you're the true kings of Couch Strike. So what I'll say is this, when you have Vitality against Spirit, I think one thing that makes this match up a banger is like I said, first of all, we've never seen it so we haven't we're not going off anything we're all theory crafting and as a result all your initial assumptions like you laid out there are going to be what's then going to get you to your conclusions there are no hard and fast rules in fact you can't even know like we say what maps you'd necessarily win because these two teams that we know what they do against other people but we have no idea what they do against each other so i think if you look on the star end of the equation this is where it suddenly got really interesting because of this silly zero angle because normally here's what i would say no problem. Both teams have an incredibly reliable, extremely good superstar. One's Donk and one's Zewu. The problem is, bizarrely, you're in a weird world where Zewu isn't actually that player right now because we don't know what form he's going to come in on. So at the moment, I actually give like the star component in terms of like reliability to Spirit because I do kind of know what like Donk and probably Shiro are going to play like. But I'll tell you what, mm -hmm. if I grant you a world where I get like pretty good or maybe very good play from Zewu and then you have, like you say, even just for a map, a Flames pop-up, it's basically the reason they've won all these tournaments and even dominated phase. If you get that and you tell me I have Zewu, Sphinx and Flames popping off, well, here's the thing, mate. When you go down to go to the Zontix, man, they don't have that third player like that. Like, Zontix can win a bunch of clutches for you. He can have a really nice half, but I, I'm not going to put him on the level of some of those names. So I think what's funny for me is I think Z, uh, Vitality, for me, have the ultimate puncher's chance. If those three players turn up and frag out, I think they can win against anyone, by the way. They can win this major. But actually, bizarrely, mm. considering they were on paper until recently, like the spiritual number one. We all know FaZe was ranked number one because they made every final. But because we haven't seen Spirit play Vitality, 
They were second before Vi uh, Katowice, guys. We all thought Vitality was the number one team in the world. So even though they've been dodgy here, part of us wants to see this matchup. Well, bizarrely, I actually do think it's most... This is why it's almost like we've inverted the favourite underdog dynamic. Because I have to say, from what I've seen, match to match to match, one thing I have to give mad props to Spirit is, this is why I'm so glad after Katowice, I did try to make people think it's not just Donk. Because, mate, the consistency of how they play as a team in Spirit is so impressive. Yeah, yeah. That's the area. Again, I, I, I get the sense myself, Chopper isn't like a tactical genius. But that aspect of it, how they're holding the team together is very impressive. Like, that was the thing I thought. I thought, look, even if your donk guy goes crazy, maybe the Zontix guy drops off. Or you know what? Maybe Megs doesn't, Magix doesn't win those clutches. Maybe they, one of their maps becomes a problem. I've got to tell it, give them credit. Since they have basically, except for the one mouse loss at that RMR, and then the couple of maps where she, Donk just played like shit for no reason. Aside from that, they just look fabulous every game, pretty much. Like, it's hard to bet against yeah. this team, isn't it? I, I agree with you. Um, <clears throat> what they really have going for them and which i think is really impressive from like a purist uh let's say a, a lover of counter-strike is they have one of the most versatile t side there currently is in the game as in like they are fully capable of executing absolutely opposite play style from round to round like there are moments where they will you almost feel like they're picking a page out of the vp book because they're gonna will down the clock until 30 seconds and any kind of aggression coming their way, they're going to absolutely easily eat it up completely and then play the 5v4, the 4v3 the way they have to, which makes it very hard to be on the aggression when you're city side against Spirit because Chopper or whoever is calling it at that moment usually has a pretty good read on when to play slow and they know how to do it. And on top of that, when they decide to play fast, I think they probably currently have some of the most refined and optimized execute there yes. is in the game. Like you can watch, if you watch like an aerial view of their executes and the timing of the entries while the smokes are popping with the flashes and all, it's like, again, I don't think there is a T side. Maybe, maybe Mouse, maybe you can argue Mouse at times can have sort of that kind of synergy and team play. But besides that, I don't think there's anybody that can hold a candle to Spirit's T side. I think it is miles ahead of anybody. And if we do a, a Spirit Vitality comparison, it is night and day. This will be one of the departments where I think Spirit's got uh, the advantage largely. On the CT side, though, I think they rely a little bit more on individual power and a few gambles here and there, which makes them sometimes vulnerable to punish. Um, they're not exactly a team that start rounds in like universal setup where they then just react to what's happening and they adjust. They have a lot of like gambles from the first second where they decide, okay, this is where we're going to go this round. And then if they lose a, a member, they stack pretty quickly. And then they rely on individuals having incredible multi-kill ability. And, and we know Shiro can do it with the AWP. We know Zontix can do it as an anchor. Uh, and obviously don't, well, not even need to mention it. So the, for me, the, the real big, big difference is the T side and the quality of the, the protocols they have on the T side. And then they rely on an incredibly skilled team on the city side. But yeah, um, all of that, is is very reliable right now i think that's why we don't see a huge drop off from them like all of it is extremely reliable um the way they play is very sustainable as well i don't think it's too gimmicky i don't think it's too uh, reliant on on gambles at all so that's why i think the floor right now for spirit is is probably one of the highest we have in the game yeah, I'll actually tie back to what we talked about in the post kind of eats episode, which is this is why I do think it's still somewhat underrated by fans because a lot of fans are just stat checking and they're just looking at the rating and they go, oh my God, the crazy numbers and they see the frags. So a lot of them are still like riding the donk hype train as if he was like simple 1v9ing, which I've always stressed. He's never been in that scenario so far. This team really does a fabulous job of playing around him and playing to his strengths. And if they somehow actually win this major and he's the MVP, I'll tell you the two things that must happen. Every single aggressive rifler you actually need for real to watch all of his demos because the things he is doing to get those weird like jiggle peaks and ducks and the way he dodges and stuff, that stuff, I thought it was a gimmick at first, mate. It's, it just works. Like it makes it so tricky when you face him, not least because people know he does that. So it gets in their head. It becomes like a mind game of how is he going to peak? Is he going to slope it? Is he just going to walk out? Like he has so many angles himself. And then the coolest thing is, Maniac, normally aggressive players like that because they're given what, you, you know, freedom by the IGL and court. Sometimes they get too much freedom and actually they don't get the setup. He also has the setup, so it feels like it's both ends. He individually does the micro moves to like sort of condition the opponent. But then the IGL himself, like you say, with the pace changes, with the flash entries, with sometimes having someone else jump for him, or sometimes it's Donk there, you never know which one it is. I also think they do an amazing job at how, uh, just on the T side of how many different looks they can give you, and even the same entry, the same yes. sight hit. Like that part is really gonna be in some teams' heads, I think. So I think. I think 
that's the aspect where for real, it's not just Donk's skill, his skill obviously is emphasizes, but the way they're using an aggressive rifler, I don't think we've ever seen this in Couch Strike Mania. If I think of the great aggressive riflers of the olden days, the Olaf Meisters of the world, the forests, etc., a lot of that was just like that they had like a reliable entry who jumps and then they just do the trade. Or if it was Olaf Meister, maybe he just runs out himself and he just had a great timing of when to go. I've never seen a team play around them this way. Normally we think of the players you play all the resources into. It's like the lurker or it's the all or something, you know. So I think in a way that's the revolutionary part of the game to me. It's like, it's the way they're using Dong. I'm so impressed by it. That's why if it holds up, I don't just look at spirit. I say like a lot of teams have to rethink how we're playing Counter-Strike right now. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's why I think they have either very one-sided wins because these are moments where the few like liberties and, and freedom they give to Dong he actually just pays off immediately. And they're like, okay, he runs up top middle Mirage, he gets a pop flash and he gets 2.5 kills immediately. So you don't even have to worry about the round. But the fact that they are able to withstand the loss of this guy early on in the round and still win, this is where they get actually incredibly like terrifying as a team, right? Because I think they are very aware of what are the scenarios, like what are the contingency plans if that move doesn't work out? Okay, we, we're gonna set up this aggression, we're gonna send him first in because that's what he likes to do. He likes to be aggressive, boom, we do the setup, whatever trick that is, and then right behind, they know how to move, how to position themselves if that didn't work out. And I think that's why they're so cool to watch is because they, they barely seem like they are caught off guard tactically like as a team like sure some players can be you, you can always have a timing against you and then you fall because you were looking on the wrong direction but if you look at tactically how they position on the map it's very rare that they are completely wrong and like they completely mistimed the situation and it's like no no they they either know how they're going to compensate for the loss of a player or they just as i said before they don't try to play the, the universal round they just say okay well we we cut our losses we're going to stack this bomb side over here we put Shiro on the other side we when AWP, maybe he can grab a kill but we're going to stack the other side they're very coherent in how they try to maximize their choices and even then that's in the worst case scenario that's in the scenario where the crazy don't one-man army situation doesn't pay off then they can still win the round but if it does then what are you even supposed to do? Like they, the fact that you have, you can, you can have, you can have, you can have bomb side situations on on the T side where you're attacking, and then you have Dong swinging wide on you, pro probably getting one to two kills, and then as you're opening up for the trade, you have Shiro posted yep. with an AD European and angle, which is the thing he likes the most in the world. So yes. I think that's also why, and that's one of the storylines that maybe is uh, the most un underrated in that lineup is that. Shiro gets to play the counter strike that he loves the yes. most in that team and you can see it like he he's not needed to entry a la monesi or whatever which is never what he was wanting to do what he wants to do is to be a punitive awp locking down lines and then gradually just taking space away from the opponent and then he has people in front of him who will take all of the first risks and then he just get to set up tack he's very reliable like when was the last time you saw shiro miss like a sitter or sure. someone walks in his crosshair he's He's almost got like 98% yes. success rate for these kind of situations. So <clears throat> he gets to do exactly what he wants. Yes. And I think that's a synergy that is underrated as well. No, I'm with you. Like the the most OP thing for She Rose game specifically. It's why actually fair play to him. I thought he lost his mind when he went to this team. Maybe he knew some I didn't. Maybe he actually like figured some of this out because the prescience seems crazy. Like as you say, he's probably the best. I used to think the vice was the king, but I think She Rose overtaking him. If it's like the seven out of ten difficulty shot, like you say, he's on, he probably hits it ninety eight percent of the time. Like you've never seen this guy whiff a shot like that James shot that he whiffed on the aforementioned crash round where he went on that construction mm. shot. Like nobody ever hit that one. Jiro will never miss that shot ever in his entire life. Like That's not even what you worry about. And then as you say, the setup almost feeds him those kills. That's crazy. One more thing on this, and then we'll talk about another team, which is one thing that did crack me the fuck up. Obviously, like you say, with all that VP crash, everyone's on a bit of a downer. Then the whole thing of like the edited out the VOD. Oh my God, the cover up. It's crazy, man. Like So what I'll say is, here's a funny bit to lighten the mood a second, which is if you go and watch the Vitality clip when Apex starts talking shit, right, about the fact that Zero's not even there, What's hilarious about this clip is the timing of when he says, like, and Zewu wasn't even here and they thought they could get us or something like that. Bro, Zewu stood like right in front of him because they're all coming down the line after the game to like do this handshake. But even then, by the way, Zewu doesn't even like, he just like looks like a thousand miles there. Like, like you said, he looked like he was a zombie, mate. He actually didn't look like, like if they're saying yeah, he's ill, he I totally believe it. Not just from in, in the server, but out of the server. So I just thought that was like a funny moment because it was one of those ones where it's like, <laughs> you essentially just said, and Zewu. He wasn't here. He's right there in front of you. Like, God, that's just I awkward mean, effects. Look, you know what I mean? 
Yeah, but that's 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 really apex. That's really know, apex here is, to do that. Like, there's sure. nobody else who could do that. Sure. But also, I I think like there's in a way, in a way, it's almost therapeutical for a team like Vitality to be able to laugh about that because sure. like it's obvious for everybody. Like for everybody, it's obvious that Zab was going through something. No, it should even be the biggest bomber of all time. You should even actually sort of think, hey, we're probably gonna lose the tournament now if he doesn't turn up. Right? Yeah, it's normally yeah, be a morale exactly. so, breaker, right? So now, if you're if you're Vitality and and you have to sort of survive through the Swiss system of the elimination stage, and you can do that with your super star that's under the weather and definitely underperforming i don't know i mean there's always many different ways to look at things but personally i i'd like to think that this is a positive signal for the rest of the team like hey we can win without him and i mean without him again he had like 1.12 rating so uh let's all be careful like he didn't have a 0 0.8 rating or he was in a negative inference all the time but it was far 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 away from what he can do but hey we can still win like hey if i'm Spinks, if i'm flames i'm i I'm probably conscious right now of the fact that, hey, I, I carried my team to the playoffs. Like, I can do it. And so I, hopefully it's something clicks in them as well where they don't overly rely on him later on in the playoffs because they had to make the moves. Like, they had to make the moves. They had to make the difference. He wasn't providing that kind of difference that he usually does. So hopefully they can carry that over. And yeah, if you're Apex, might as well laugh about it. <laughs> Just be sure. fucking obvious about it. You know? Well, as, it you, as you guys have seen, it may be actually, if it had just been a different team in Envy, maybe Maniac would have been a great coach because you see he has unlimited hopium. He has, he, he will never surrender. He'll always, <laughs> like even, he even flipped the narrative to like, but wait, we're winning without him though. So that's even better. It's like, okay, whatever. Listen, it's all good. That is one angle. One thing I will say is fun though, is this is another reason why the bracket specifically is so fun, mate. Because mate, normally I'm supposed to say with Cloud9, like, I should pick Vitality to beat them. You know, like a lot of reasons. Bro, if you were to set up a match for C9 now that is winnable, remember, they don't have a traditional opera. G will be an ill's a pretty fucking banging angle to give them a chance. Then you think even when Vitality was really good at that blast last year, they had that amazing playoff match that was like super close. C9 could have won. That was when they were in theory both their peak. And right now, I do think it's slightly overperforming, but guys... C9 is fragging out of control right now. All the and the best angle of all, we all complained the last month or so. May Axile heard the call, he got the memo. The, like Gandalf the fucking white, he has actually arrived at this major and looks pretty fucking good. That's the funnest thing of all is like, I do think even if C9 wins this match, mate, I still wouldn't have them win the major. I think they actually, they're, they're the only team in the top half of the bracket I don't think can win the major or even make the final. But I'll tell you what, they've somehow locked into a, like, a tournament favourite. That looks like it's not even impossible they can win this. Like C9's kind of on a heater right now. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I, and I have to be honest, I don't really know what to make of the Axel situation. Because you say we've been complaining about him for a month. I'll say I've been complaining about him for a okay. year and a half. Okay. Like even okay. with the previous True. even True. with the previous Gambit roster into okay. the Cloud9, I think whenever we came to land, and then of course when the super team got put together, then that was even the worst. Oh sure. Um, so yes. for me, like the, the the negative bias comes from from way, way earlier. But then somehow, yeah, holy shit. What is this Axel that we're seeing now with Cloud9? So I don't even know like how to mentally get my head around it. I don't know if it's a if it's a fuck this situation where he has nothing to lose anymore. And I think maybe he is aware that if there isn't anything that changes drastically right now, then that might just be his last event. And he just decided to throw caution to the wind. Because one of the kind of interesting numbers you can find if you dig a little bit deeper is that he's got the most opening frag attempt of the team now. Like someone that I would prior uh, peg as overly passive sure. and like super shy in the game and not really taking any decisions and kind of letting him come to him. Like at this event, he's been like always going in. He's making make tons of moves on the CT side, pushing a whole lot. So I don't really know. Either it's been like a team conversation where, where they with him discuss like, hey, listen, like this is what you need to do from now on. Like we need you to take this risk. We need you to have these plays and all. Or it's just he decided that, hey, Whatever I was doing isn't working. I might be on my way out, but if I'm going out, I'm going out on the blaze of glory. And I'm going to push. And, and lo and behold, <clears throat> now he's actually finding the kills already on. And he's, hey, his uh, eye test is much better. Yes. Because also he was supposed to be a guy that we talked as very, very skilled. Of course. He didn't see that skill for about six months now. And now he's starting to have like a low time to kill again. So, yeah, this is a, a very unfortunate timing for the Vitality fans around the world. You would really love to have Axile being uh, underwhelming. That's just not the case. And then the, the one angle, if, you, if you're looking for, for weaknesses on the Cloud9 side, is that Boomich remains super inconsistent on the map that he plays. I think he's got maps where with the AWP, things click pretty well, 
like Anubis is a good example. Ancient is a good example. Uh, well, here it doesn't really play with you all, but at least individually he's decent. And he's got maps where he struggles a whole lot. So that's that's your one way in, I think, if you're trying to fight Cloud9. But it is true that with Axile on this level, then the skill overall of this lineup is super frightening. And also Electronic having a little bit of resurgence after a quiet RMR. I'm not going to lie. I, th I think they definitely have a... They have a say in this Vitality game. The, ma the, the map pool also is pretty, like, they meet in the middle. Like, they shake hands on the maps they want yes. to play. There's no, I punish you, you punish me. Yeah, they all want totally to play maps pools. they're comfortable yeah. with. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah, I don't know. I think I agree with you. I don't imagine a world in which Cloud9 wins this major. But in that specific matchup, I'm going to show up to the desk tense as hell. And I'm going to be worried for Vitality probably until the very last second of this game. No, I actually agree as well. Yeah, it, it, it has all the hallmarks of potentially a great one too. I actually think, because like you say, there's some shared maps on this one too. It's quite a fun angle, so everyone should be comfortable. Hopefully it takes with the choke component, people mm -hmm. split the back. On the Axile thing, I will say I know what you mean. Like, the problem I have is this. When people said, I had, here's the problem. There's a take, and it goes like this. Because people are doing like, well, what is different from Axile now? From then, it's like you say, it's the super team, right? Before, when he had Nefani as his IGL, that's when he was the superstar player. So people are thinking, Thinking must be Nafani's calling style, but it's like, guys, isn't the one thing we all banged on Nafani his calling style? Wasn't that like the least effective part of his game? If anything, to me, it's that Nafani actually on T side was a lunatic. He was the guy who was the IGL would go in. He would just go and make a fight. I actually thought that is amazing if you're someone like Axar. I've always said this in history. As much as like someone like Forrest at one point in time was the best player, he also in his style doesn't want to be the first one in. He wants like your Freiburg or someone to run in. And then he does the amazing trading and cleans up the site. Everyone knows the forest ones, he come in like midway through the pack. So to me, that's where you put like an Axile at his best. But the difference is, Boomich maybe does it a bit more now. I do think he lost his own actually like feel for the game though, because I, I refuse to believe. People were implying he was just washed skill-wise. Like I know it's CS2, so to be fair, Last time he was really great was in CSGO. You can, there's a little bit of difference there. But the thing is, Moniak, when you think of the eye test in 2022 of this guy, like when this guy would dominate, he was one of the most fun AK players to see in the whole world. He was so crisp. His fucking duels he would take. I mean, he wasn't on a John level, but he had his own like sort of like, he was so good at doing the jiggle peek and just the instant headshot. Like he looked like, he was one of those players where I guarantee if you go watch one of those like reverse POV movies, I bet it's mega satisfying. I bet it looks like he's just clean every time he's entering. But he had lost that. When players like that drop off, to me, it's always something like they're not in the right role, the calling style doesn't fit them, something psychological, because you don't lose skill. You don't just wake up one day as talented as this guy was. It wasn't like he was just getting the frags on off. He was, he was outright winning duels, guys. He was out shooting people. When you have that level of skill, it's a bit like when Spinks was a bit weird when he was in the initial vitality. I knew this can be worked out. The question just is, do you get the time? Is the role available mm. for you? Do people believe in you? If they don't, yeah, you'll get shipped out, which, by the way, it could have happened to a Spinks if he hadn't gotten cooking. But just like Spinks and Axel coming back now, they, if they have that talent level, at least you know it's in there. That's a way better problem to have, in my opinion, than the player where it's like, can they go to another? That's a different equation completely. So luckily, thus far, it has worked so far. And I will say, this is also the last reason why I think this could be a great matchup, actually, even though a lot of people are probably sleeping on it, is because Vitality's looked out of sorts and across the board. And they can't, they are, I think they even can't, that's also why I agree with you. I think they're trying to use the humor as this sort of soothing balm to knowing that they're not in great shape. They know they're not the team that won all those finals right now they haven't been that obviously kind of eight so they were semi irrelevant so i think actually mm. vitality is sort of there for the taking but the difference is i can see a million different ways this vitality player turns up or he doesn't this other guy turns up maybe this other one is having an okay game the difference is for cloud nine you need almost every factor to go right that's the difference i thought yeah, i think cloud yeah, nine sort of has to play peak cs otherwise i don't i don't think they can fall in a win and win this one maniac yeah, yeah. I, and I don't I think, think they can win the major. Won. I don't know about um, you. Do you think they can win the major? No, no. Uh, Cloud9? No, no, I don't I don't think so. I, it's one of the few teams um, that I would really, really struggle to see lifting the whole trophy. I yes. think the path for that would then be way too complicated um, from quarter, semi, to then the, whoever they would play in the grand final. I'm also so scared as well. If they somehow fluked this major, right, Cloud9 style, immediately, like two days later, you'd have that, like, the score esports video, like, the AWP isn't even good at it. You know what I mean? Like... <laughs> No, 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 no. Get out of here. I know. Get out of here. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like that'd be, that'd like, be like I, the newbie take, wouldn't it? 
That was one of my take at the very beginning of the major. I said, sure. if you are a fan of Cloud9, you want them to fail yes, just exactly. so that they can change. Yes. You know, like yes. if you really are a fan, but then again, Again, if, if everything clicks now, then what am I left with? I just just to quickly add as well on the Axel topic, you, you made a point about like the, the the promise of a player. Yeah. And it's one of the elements that I sometimes I, I catch myself not giving it enough attention and importance. Axel is an incredibly young player. Sure. The issue that he's got is that when the super team got together, we all wanted result today. Yes. Like we wanted result immediately. Yes. And this was the on the premise of how the the Gambit duo was functioning, how strong the Navi core was. We thought we have all the reasons in the world to think this is going to click immediately, and it didn't. And then I personally became extremely frustrated with it, and I thought, you sure. know what? Fuck this. Like, change. Yes. Like, what, what are we doing? But the truth is, he is only 21. Like, you, you have to imagine that even if you, like, hit hardships at some moment, that whatever he's displayed in the past... The future, it's, it, it cannot be downward. Like It cannot go downwards for his whole future. That's not, not, it's not possible when you're 21 unless there are reasons that we're not really aware of. So I guess maybe I'm being too impatient with him. I still, I was still at odds with, with what he was giving and delivering on the server for quite a long time. Um, and I don't, I don't know if one strong major would be enough to just change my whole perspective on it. But I will say that he is indeed the future if you're looking at, if you want to bank on a player and if you want to help a player go through any type of hard moment and it, help them figure that out, then yeah, of course, of course, he's got a, he's got many, many years of great Counter-Strike ahead of him, uh, whereas some other guys uh, might be a bit more on the way out. Like Hobbit is obviously on the other side of that spectrum where Hobbit is extremely reliable, super versatile. There is a lot of moment where if you'd ask me, and probably still today, I would probably keep Hobbit over Axile in terms of versatility right now, but that, would that be short-sighted for me? Like, would I... It's not the same long-term upside, right? He can't be yeah, like... Exactly, he's not going to be yeah. a top 20 player in four years, is he? Yeah. Exactly. So True. am I being short-sighted here? And then wouldn't it be better to just make sure Axel can, can pass through that period that he's having with a few months that yes. he's had? Maybe that is a more of a long-term period. That was something that evaded me a little bit. I think I was just being impatient and I just wanted result from this Clown9 roster much, much sooner than they arrived. Here's or the thing, though. Yet I, to arrive. I don't blame you because the key thing to say is this. People, this is actually, in my opinion, the struggle in Counter-Strike. I'd even say, actually, the economic conditions potentially even make it play more towards that side, which is, I actually do think in Counter-Strike, I mean, my magic number's about three months. I think if you haven't produced results within that, it's rare that your team's going to somehow magically in the fourth month just figure out, you know, Eureka, then just figure the game out and everyone's going to play better. Usually, you've tried everything at that point. You've had your scrims, you've had a few tournaments, you've had the one where you got lucky, you've had the one where you got unlucky, you had the one where it was sort of in the middle, you've had a bunch of online qualified... By that time you usually know if the team's good or not but that's the that's the difference though between is my job as the gm qualified to this major well in that case we better be good now but like you say the trickier part is if i have a player i actually think could be like one of the great players of the era like we say someone in four years might be a top 20 player still or again depending on which we like it's hard to let that player go because you always feel like an idiot if he goes to the other team and in six months he is the best second best Russian rifle and then mm -hmm. you'd feel like a moron wouldn't you so I know what you mean and then the problem becomes even though in the short term maybe Hobbit fit my squad now all of a sudden I'm looking at Hobbit like oh, fuck what a fuck it's like those back in the day when I used to do the <laughs> stickers trading you've traded the wrong one that was the fucking turn out that was the important one shit I didn't know that was more of a common one you know you bought it at that one yeah it's true the difference between the long term goal and the short term is really tricky I agree and then what I'd do is this the fun thing about the teams in the bottom side is Every single, what's fun about this is it's like you've put all the dark horses on one bracket side because every one of these teams in their own way, Maniac, perhaps with the exception of G2, I think could go to the final. Now, look, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and immediately hit and say, I, until I can't, but I think you think they can't. So I'll, I'll leave that open for the conversation right now. The reason I actually think I, even the G2 one, I can't shit on. Look, I think they've looked terrible at this event. I was loving my pick to be the only person who didn't pick up the playoffs. They even looked, remember, Inferno was their fucking map pick, guys. Like, they looked like they were just going to go out of this tournament. And, I, and I'll admit to you right now, Maniac, I had a tweet in my drafts where I was going to ask G2 to fire Hooksy because he fucking he's not only overrated but he talked shit on my boy Kassad so I was coming with all the fucking hounds of hell to come after this motherfucker <laughs> but luckily for him God himself reached down and pushed Jim out from behind the boxes and they won the round so you know what I, who am I to argue with God Maniac if God is on Hooksy's side then who am I to be against him so one thing I'll say I'll give one lifeline to G2 it goes like this they do have modesty mate 
They do have Monacy. And I'll tell you what, Monacy right now is the best AWPer in this tournament. So there's a world where Monacy can win you a lot of maps that you shouldn't be winning, where it should be going against. So I'll, I'll always say that player alone gives you the point. By the way, Nico hasn't been the greatest, but there's a world Nico wakes up for a series. You can never count against superstar players. There's one thing to have good players. These are mm -hmm. in, these are insanely good players. Like These are players, remember, and if you have two of them, Maniac, here's why superstar theory will always, whether it's actually true, whether it's efficacious, it will always dominate the imagination, and here's why. Because we all know the best thing about a superstar is they can at least win you one map. Well, here's the thing, Maniac. When you got two, you only need to win two maps out of three. There's a world where this is why I actually think, for real, the angle that's unfair to G2 goes like this. Because they don't have JKS, who was there in all the wins, the pressure is way bigger on Nico and Monacy now. Because now if you have those players, here's the thing. People don't really mind when Hunter has these bad maps, mate. Because he's Hunter. And he never actually was. He never had the, the name of an equal. He was never up in lights, you know. He was always like just entering the star category. So he's allowed to not be that good. Nixon, we all think he's a cool guy. Seems like he does contribute to the team. He was never expected to frag. The real problem is you have massive weight on your shoulders if you're honestly an equal. Like you basically have to win these matches. You're supposed to in a fucked up way. Even though I don't know if it's fair. You play a lot of good teams. Yeah. <laughs> No, I mean I, that's fair. I just, I just unfortunately think that what we had seen at the RMR from Nico, which is again a, a, a touch of brilliance and like the the good old flavor of the Nico, turns out that apparently it was more a flash in the pan. And actually, we, we have reverted back to the average now at this event. Like he's been. By the way, he was kind of whacking that VP event. series, mate. I bet there's another thing. I'll tell you what that that crash not only saved Huxley, that might have saved Nico because bro, if he goes out of another major in the group stage, people would have rushed and looked no. at that match, and he wasn't doing well in that match. He was having some bad fucking maps, no, mate. So it, I think he would be getting flamed right his, now. <laughs> by his standards, he's not having a great major, right? Sure. I mean, if we if we're gonna let, let me let me put it this way, right? Let me put it this way, just to to play with numbers just a little bit we said Zaiwu was far from his best yes. and we talked about how he was sick and he delivered poor counter-strike well he had a 1.12 rating Nico had a 105 that that is the world we live in now like yes. we, we have created this entire narrative about Zaiwu being sick and being poor and disappearing at the end of the day, he still had a higher rating. So I know we have to be a little bit careful with that. Sure. Like just comparing ratings short term is very short sighted. But that's just a just a reminder of the fall from grace from from the Nico that we knew and the Nico that is now. I mean, he was also very vocal about it. Like when he tweeted, uh, "CS2 sucks," and so does my aim, or something like that. He sure. tweeted about it. So I think he's aware himself sure. of the like the, the issue that he's having. So that's that's my one problem. You say you say G two have two superstars, and on paper uh, there's there's very little for me to argue against that. But but one of them is arguably on the leave of absence since CS two oh, no, came around. Yeah. So he can always come back. And then the other angle, and something that is a little bit undertalked as well. Do you realize this is Monacy's first playoff at a major? People don't realize that's kind that of sick to think about. Yep. This is why, it by the way, the, the, other, the other reason I was going to say to fire Huxy is because, bro, this would have been three majors with no playoffs. One, he didn't even qualify to. The other two, they just didn't make the playoffs. Like, if you have the team he has, mate, can I at least have a playoff appearance? You know what I mean? I'm not, Maybe not even with the event, but yeah, no. that, that's the worst thing for Monacy. He's had all that experience. By the way, he's even won tier one lands, but he's never even played one playoff game, which is another factor, right? If I'm going to take him as the big puncher's chance, let's hope he doesn't fucking turn up with map one with a little bit of butterflies, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, if if, we, if we're gonna say if we're gonna say G 2s angle is the superstar power, and we're already prefacing it by saying, ah, Nico is actually kind of far from that scenario. But you know, maybe we're we're getting lucky. We're getting the good Nico, and then that can get the ball rolling. Then what does that mean by by consequence? It means yes. that honestly, better freaking show up. Like you immediately have to show up. Put it this way: I don't think unless something out of this world happens, I don't think there's a world in which G two win against Miles without Monacy. And, and I mean without an exceptional Monacy, like without the high level Monacy. Like a, a pedestrian Monacy that has a below or an above average rating, G2 doesn't win. There's no universe in which they win. And that is a, is a pretty heavy load to have on your shoulder being Monacy. Of course, you've already won and you've already been on some stages, but it's your first playoff at a major. That's, that's the one little line that on your resume right now is still blank. And, and you are supposedly by power ranking, one of the best players in the world in CS2 right now. Yep. A lot of people tell you you're the best snipers yeah. in the world right now, but, but you've never been at the playoff of a major. And now, apparently, if you don't show up, your team is going to lose. So that in itself is kind of a cool storyline to see how he handles that, that position like under heavy pressure if his team is going to perform.
Bro, I don't know what's going on. I actually do in a way, which is, if you notice, even when I actually broke down spirit, I did have so many logical, like, analytical-based reasons as to why they should win that at the end, it wasn't just like, I hope they don't choke. It's like, actually, essentially, they'd almost need to choke to give the other team a chance at this point, and even then, they might still win. But I'll say this, mate. Normally, people will know I am a fucking dedicated mouse hater because mouse normally... If, if this was a previous tournament maniac, like a past major when they didn't have Shuhi, this is exactly where Mouse would do this. They'd go look awesome in the Swiss. Yeah. They'd get to the playoffs. You might even have a team they're supposed to beat. Like, hey, they're supposed to beat G2 now. And then you just know me. I would have bet my house on anyone else on the other side of the server. I would go, you know what? Torshi's no. not going to turn up. Dex is not going to call a good game. They're going to lose map one and they're going to somehow lose this series. The problem is this maniac. Again, I feel like, I, I don't know, maybe that Geo Storm did change who I am. Because, bro, I'm actually going to say, I think Mouse are really really going to win this series, mate. I don't even say, like, they're the fit. I think they're going to actually blow them out. Like, I think most right now, the team, again, if I watch it in the server, there are so many good things. First of all, I'll point this out in a past episode. Everyone frags. Now, look, let's, let's just get our dick back in our pants. Jim Fat is not going to have a 1.5 rating. That is called <laughs> overperformance. But I can tell you what, I can have a 1.1 rating and he's not even their star player. So when you look at the talents that Shui has, he has like a toolkit of talents in all the roles. Even if you want to say about Tosh, he might not, mm. he might be a chalk. They can, win, they can win off an exertion T side. They can win off fucking fragging by Brawlan. Like they have so many tools. And then actually I do, this is an Nigel, I, I kind of buy the story now. Now I get, same way I've, I've given Cricks in his credit, but more so, I, I actually thought maybe it is a flash in the pan that Game Allegiant team because the Immer guy stats were a little bit too good. Even people like Acoy weren't even that good, were having like you know maps where they were just going crazy. You just even the Isaac guy was winning those bonkers rounds against the Rock. You thought, can this really compete? I see what the hype about the Shuhi guy was now, mate. I think it's true. He is the truth. Mm. He is legit as fuck. Yes. And I have to say, right yeah. now, I think most angles that I can come up with just go to mouse in this one. Like there's only that modesty angle, essentially, I can pick for G2. Aside from that, I think Mouse actually, like, what? how do they lose this series? Essentially, because here's the last thing to remember as well, guys. Collectively, Mouse, the team, a bunch of them have been in a major playoffs before. Obviously, they beat Cloud9 at IM Rio. And then the aforementioned show here was in the final of that major. Like, their actual experience gap's not even that bad, bro. Like you say, the joke is it's Modesty that's an experience day. In our brains, we think yeah, the yeah. other way, it's like, hey, they better be able to... I don't even know if Modesty's turning up. Who fuck knows if Nico is? So I actually think, quite frankly, you have to... I'll do the same thing with Cloud9. Bro, I'm going to need to see everything from G2 to win this. I think low-key, Mouse actually has somehow peaked for the major. Like, there's a real world where... Put it this way, spoiler, I actually went with my angle. I'm taking Na'Vi to go in the final, so we'll get to that later. But I don't hate all the people I've seen taking Mouse, mate. I can see why they're picking them. If I had to sort of, like, not think of I mean, intangible, I think I would pick Mouse. Right now, they're, they're looking very uh, good. They have an incredible uh, resume, I would say, moving into this playoffs of the majors. Like, you also look at the teams that have eliminated Mouse in, like, high-profile games yes. over the last few months, and this is a very short list. Like, yes. There's a very short list of teams that are capable of beating this mouse. And of course, I think there is some sort of psychological barrier with FaZe. Seemingly, mouse is not yes. capable of beating. And there's a loss to vitality. But that's it. Like That is literally the list of teams that I have beaten mouse. They've even beaten Spirit in a obviously a different context. Now, if we play the game of what has to happen in order for mouse to fuck it up, then I think Brolan and Torji are the two most adequate candidates for falling off Fair and disappearing enough. in a high pressure match that's, that's the way i look at it yeah i i fully trust in shuhi and in his calling i i was already on board on the shuhi train a while ago and everything that's been happening ever since have just convinced me that he is indeed uh one of the next greatest one in terms of igl i have no doubt um jim pat doesn't need 1.5 i just think he's got ice in his veins anyway like he's already an extremely reliable sure. anchor who's going to go beyond what his what his task list is supposed to be. And then I think Zershan, Zershan is like improving with time and it is understandable because he's such a playmaker that experience will inevitably help him figure out when and what works in what context. And he's going to have mistakes, his games that he struggles with because he's the one that puts himself in the most dangerous positions every time. Like you watch Miles, he's the one that takes like the, the crossing of the smoke or the 60-40 the gamble. Like he takes all of them. So the more time passes, and if he's a clever guy, which I think he is, eventually he's going to figure out and he's going to filter out like the moves that he does and all the tricks that he uses. So exertion I'm already ready to believe in. It's not really Torji that 
at times I've had issues with in like high profile game. And I do think Brolan sometimes can sink in his own well of despair. I've seen him sort of like disappear mentally, but these were maybe more of the older days in different lineups. So maybe I'm a little bit biased and in this different environment, it's not the same, but I have strong images in my mind of him sort of wallowing and like a s sad moment in game. So if it isn't for Torsion and Brolan, to me, like, like Miles have the upper hand on G2 by a very large margin. Like yes. I'm, I, this, this to me is like a 65-35 a or a 70-30 type situation on, on paper when I'm looking at this matchup. And here's actually why, if Mouse made the final, well, obviously, that would be a very interesting angle if they played Spirit. They just beat them at the RMR. That's one of the few teams that fucking beat these guys, admittedly close, but yeah, they still beat them. So I think that would even be cool. And also, by the way, if you have Spirit against Mouse in the final... CS2 is a different generation of fucking Counter-Strike at this point, guys. Look at those players. Like, where are all the old stars? Like, mm. the joke is, in those teams, you talk about, like, Shiro being a veteran. He only came along after the online era. Like, that would be a very interesting way to sort of announce CS2 to the world, mate. Yeah, absolutely. Whereas if instead it ends up being, like, G2 against FaZe, that's, we've all seen those players I play know, a billion I matches, know. haven't we? You know what I mean? By the way, here's the obvious angle. I, I, I kept it till the end, Maniac, because I thought there might be some spice here. Hit me with it. Hit me with the reasons why. Because you're you're, you're taking Eternal Fire to beat Navi, right? You're taking them to win. I'm going to disappoint you, but no, I have Navi. Oh right, oh, I actually had Navi. So I thought you were going to hype up the Eternal Fire side for me. You're not, you're not going to ride with them. You're not going to believe in the well, dream. So, so, okay, well, I, I, I will set you up so that you can come in with like a, a wash of reality check. Come I'll on. set you up for that. Come on, come on. I I I understand how watching Eternal Fire right now. If you have an ounce of romance in your heart, you feel like holy hell, everything is clicking. This is this is finally this team coming together after so many years of struggle on Turkish Counter Strike. They finally believe in Major, and now they found this Wikadia Diamond in the Rough and Zentaris is holy shit delivering 1.3 plus rating all the time. And hey, Woxie can have a good game here and there, and Calix is super reliable. Like I think there's there's a way that you can look at this lineup and think like sky is the limit in like a storm, like a micro yeah. storm that's happening now and everything clicks. And, and, and if you think like that, I'm not going to fault it. I'm not going to fault you for that. But my, my issue is if you are talking about a team that has a propensity to check out mentally from games, you are also looking at the freshest, most rookie team there is at majors. It is a reality. The least amount of playoffs appearances, even for majors, only yep. one major debutant. Yep. That is where the, the romantic in me sort of has to give up. And like the professor comes in in the suit to be like, okay, what, what the shit is going on here? No, listen, that, that, that is unfortunately my angle. <laughs> okay, okay. At the end, I don't know. Manex is not riding with any of the, Normally, you love the romantic story and the young player who's going to go I to know, the next level. I know. And I'm the one who has to come in with the bitter, throw the bucket water in your face. Of course, they aren't, you bloody idiot. They've never been a major player before. What are you talking about? Well, they, they have, no, okay, we've just shifted the dynamic here. It's all good. That's the way I even hyped you up. I was it's, even like ready to go with you. You know, I was ready to join the romance and see if I get swept away in it all. But okay, if we're just doing cold, hard reality, here's the problem that you have. It's quite an obvious one. So, first of all, you have to look at this, right? Which is. This is why I'm actually going to do a video on this. Don't worry. I'm going to do a video explaining why I'm sort of like a major hater. And even then, hater's more his personality. I actually think as an IGL, he's actually entering the hooksy equation for me. I've described on past episodes where like, if you win the games, I have to say you're doing something right. I just don't know that you're a tactical genius, which is what we often infer if you're a great end game leader, right? But what I will say is this. The reason why I'd, I'm not a fan of that narrative is because bro, he had 10 years to show you with Zantaras and Calix that he was the genius IGL and it was all his strats. In Instead, he's walked into a super team of Turkish players. Like, guys, not only, now we know the Wikadia guy is another, like, revelation rookie, the other three players are the three players everyone had for all of history on their Turkish super team. It was, I want to see Zantares play with Woxic and Kalix. Now, true, you're right, nobody had Kalix in, like, the supportive aspects of the game. Yeah, we all had him as a star as well, like Zantares. In fact, the dream there was you had the two aggressive riflers and you had the Opa, right? True, that's not what they've got. But with Wikadia being sick, you actually, unironically, have four Turkish star players. Not a star player in the sense of other teams in this tournament, but traditional roles and actually I am even somewhat impressed that they've managed to find a role for Calix who kind of was considered the failed Zantaris he didn't quite make it he had his chance in contact and all seems to be the do envy or whatever they were in like he had the, he was in these squads and he was given the roles it's just he was good but he wasn't Zantaris and by the way even Zantaris wasn't Zantaris sometimes he is at this tournament I'll give him that my problem is this first of all 
everyone is fragging too well in this team. Like, spoiler, Major has a 1.2 rating in this tournament. Like, that's history, not Thorin. History tells you that cannot hold. Now, I will give him credit. He did in 1.6, Maniac knows this, when he was in the French scene. He wasn't an in-game leader, guys. He was a fragger himself. He actually had pretty crispy AK. He was an interesting player. But that's not the role he's doing now. He is the IGL now, absolutely. You can tell by the roles in the team. So that, I think, made people essentially... The ro that part of the romance, I have to immediately you know, like throw the bucket of water on the two dogs fucking. It's like, calm down on that one. With that said, though, there's obviously some great knockout power here. Like, I'll tell you what, I might give them the edge fire power-wise against Na'Vi, mate. Like, Na'Vi, actually, once you get past Wonderful, you don't know if GL's going to turn up. You have no idea how him is going to play. Is Bit here for the game? Is he just average? You never know in Na'Vi. So, there's certainly like a bit of a puncher's chance. Maybe they can win a map. They can make it interesting. My problem is, again, I feel like you have to have the super team come, but you have to have a lot of people frag out. You have to have a lot of people play really lights out CS. And the problem is, as you said, of all the teams I can be cynical about major experience, this is easily it. Because the only one is Woxic. That one time at the bullshit face at Major London with that Hellraiser squad we all remember back in the day. And it's not like they were relevant. So the problem is, Woxic himself has been gone for ages, guys. This is the team that's brought him back to life. It's even why, if people don't remember, there was always that thing in, in Turkey of like, why don't Woxic and Zantaris play together? They never, they never decided to make it happen. Happen. So as much as the romance is cool if you're Turkish, if you're anyone else, this just feels like, unfortunately, I think Na'Vi just beat you by being boring. I think Blade just comes with a great game plan. I think Na'Vi, by the way, has the most predictable veto in the universe. But then again, there's one map that the, the Tailfire is really good on, and I think you won't be seeing that against Na'Vi. So there's a problem you have immediately. You needed that specific map. So I, I think if you come into this one, I, I, I'm riding with my boy Alexi B for this one, mate. I'm saying he wins this. I think he takes yeah. it. I, I agree. And one way I like to look at things when I'm considering a matchup and I'm trying to figure out a favorite is I'm thinking, what are the safety net in place if some individuals, right. key individuals, yes. are having a hard time? Like, yes. how what is the team relying upon so that they can make up for who's having a hard day? And like, how strong are the fundamentals in the team? And how strong is the calling? When you're watching Eternal Fire play, I get the strong sense that Major is way or oh, he's doing way too much in order to keep everyone in line like in the right mindset with the right. calls and with the communications and all i've seen him like talk a whole lot just to make sure that everything is right with a very high intensity if you're going to tell me that's going to happen on stage that for me they're absolutely unsustainable like it's unsustainable for a leader to have to overcompensate for the lack of comms from his right. players uh, and, and that's a little bit of the apex conundrum as well like a vitality that's struggling it's apex just talking way too much and losing track of things um I'm worried about Eternal Fire in that sense. If they're having a hard time and they start shutting down and now suddenly it's Major who has to micromanage three parts of the map at once, I think he's going to completely lose himself. And this is where you you get the the drop in performance that you're talking about. Like There's no way he performs like that if he has to pull out fires left, right, and center. So I really think that the floor of Navi is much higher just because they have like their game plan, I feel like, is much more established. And they also probably rely on individuals being capable of making decisions in chaos a bit better than a fire. I mean, we can criticize bit, Bit's performance, but the truth is he's got experience in that oh, context course, yeah. in the major multi major major winner as well. So I, I really feel like if shit hits the fan in Navi, there are more safety nets that are here to save them and to make sure that they maintain some of the protocols that they have. Whereas for Eternal yeah. Fire, it's a, it's a bit all or nothing. Like it's all or nothing. Either like everything clicks and they will eat you alive, or uh, the wheels come off, and then it's, it's, it's going to be very wonky, and then I think Major is going to drown trying to save his squad. So that is why, when I'm considering these two teams, I, I side slightly with Navi, because I think on a, on a play of game on stage, some bad shit is bound to happen. Like, you are going to lose city rounds. You are going to lose city clutches. You are going to get ecoed, or you're going to lose to deagles. Like, this is bound to happen. And the question is, how good is a team at bouncing back from that? And what do they have to help them bounce from that kind of situation? And I gave I give Navi the favor in that in that sort of equation. And I do think, again, in light of the fact that I stressed for Eternal Fire so little experience, people are forgetting because of what a weird bunch of names. Every Na'Vi player has been in the playoffs. In fact, everyone except Wonderful has been in the semis or better. Like they actually have collect mm -hmm. individually a lot of experience in playoff scenarios. So in that situation, yes. I'm not as worried about some of those names. And then also on the Na'Vi style, I do notice the tough thing about this is like, for example, if I have Na'Vi going to the final, like I think it's possible. I don't think they're going to win there. I don't think they can beat the other teams. And the reason why is the issue on Na'Vi, this is why that whole discussion 
keeps raising up of like, if Simple is going to rifle, then should he replace Immer? Like the reason why that conversation is going to continue to be stirred up is beyond wonderful, and even wonderful isn't Simple and Zero guys, just a very good opera. Beyond wonderful, you do sometimes like a little bit of firepower. And as a result, even when Na'Vi wins, they do make a bit of a dog's dinner of it, Maniac. They win a lot of 13-11 games and overtime games and 13-10 games. Mm. And yeah, true, they also yeah. lose a lot of those games too. But like, it, it feels like it can be quite hard to get everything out of the team. It's actually why another thing I do credit in this team is I credit a Blade and Alexi B. Like, it looks like... One thing I love about Blade is this, Maniac. I've said it in the past. It can be a weakness short term that he always has the professor mindset of like, look, let's go over it again. If I explain it to you like this way and this concept, and let me drill this concept in. That in a long run, if your players had unlimited learning potential, would make you the greatest team of all time eventually, which you could argue... He kind of did that, do that with RV 2021. Remember, when they first made that bit move, actually, they were still a bit dodgy. This new students to Gambit, people used to be flaming them. That was when Famously Richard sort of was like, is this guy even doing a good job as a coach? He got all the backlash. But you give Blade, as he asked for, like his six months, and fucking hell, we all know how insane that team was. The joke is, only mm. Putin could stop them, is the fucking unfortunate scenario, right? Because no one will ever know what would happen to that team. We all, even Pumich, I'm sure, still wonders what would have happened with that lineup. The difference now is, that's not not the lineup you have, but again, I think about what a mess they were when they first had to bring out Wonderful in and mate, tournament to tournament. I see what they're working on, I see them get a better map pool, I see them yeah. win against an opponent that beat them before. And the other thing that is cool with them as well is they were the team that gave Spirit a decent game at Kanavitsa. They've also shown they can match up with the big squad. So I know it's hard because you think of Navi, first of all, you think of simple, you think of electronic, you think of having the most crazy firepower. That's not really this Navi, but they're still a fucking good team, mate. They're still a pretty good squad. I mean, they. They took a map of spirit again here. Yeah, um, that's exactly. Not two different events where they take a map yes. of spirit. So I think you have to give it to them. And also, again, I, I know Alexi B is a very polarizing figure, but if you pay attention to Navi's game on the T side specifically, you can see his problem solving ability. Like you can just see it. It's it's not a skill that every leader has to that extent. Like the ability to, after twenty or twenty one, twenty two rounds of game to have the right call, like have yes. the right idea to figure out, okay, this is what we need to do. I've seen it happen time and time again with Navi at this event. And it's yes. such a strong skill to have to know that, of course, Blade gets credit from that too, because in foreshadowing of the event, in advance of the event, they're working on all of these strategies. They're working on all of these solutions. So it's not like Alexi B is materializing new ideas immediately and spontaneously. They've, they've worked on it together. But to have this ability to sort of tailor what you need to do and have the right call at the right time at the end is is something that I give Alexi B a lot of credit for. And if we're playing the matchup of major Alexi B and you ask him, okay, Maniac, the score line now is going to be 11-11. You have to tell me who you believe more than... I would I would tend towards Alexi B. I feel like he's building a body of work where he gets to have like the right call at the right time and he wins these overtimes. He wins the 11-13 game. So that's a very, very, very strong asset to have. The, the the problem is the individual output of of bit and email as, as simple as it is yes. and, and I and I cannot pretend that I have uh, figured that one out I really don't know I thought that time would be the most meaningful factor for bit and the transition from you know speaking his mother tongue to English would <coughs> impair him for a while and then eventually he'd get better and then he would frag out like crazy it's not really the case so I think my theory kind of balls off a little bit uh, whereas for email. I mean, listen, un unfortunately, unless there are things in, the, in that team that we do not know about, that we're not aware of, there is no way you can maintain that kind of performance with the roles that he has. There is no way. Like, he has roles and resources to frag out. Like, he has quote-unquote superstar positions. So it's, I, it, there's, there's no way out of it. Like, I, yes. I don't even know what kind of conversation needs to be, to be having between the group stage and the playoffs, I would hate to be in that position. But if if that doesn't pan out, then Navi is going to have to ask some serious questions about the future, and then, and then consider the replacing of this guy because he's he, he's getting way too much space and attention for the outcome that's coming with it. Yes, and you, you, that's why I, I I don't really hate people when they say, oh, you know, what, how could Navi play with a different player in that role? Yeah, I think it's a valid question. Like with all of the other elements that we're building up and hyping up about that team, if you plug and play, it's the obvious uh, person player, place. You plug in like a new player. Yeah. It, ooh, oh my god! Like you could yes. you could have an absolute death machine right there. So yes, yeah, he, he's in a very uncomfortable position. I I I make it real. I think he's on the chopping block.
Yes, oh, I'm with you completely. Like, first of all, on the Alexi B one, this is actually why, if people don't know, I was one of the first people to, like, stay on that train when everyone hopped off when he be when he joined the OG team, was because I've famously always said, I got to hear the calls when he was actually in Flashpoint. And I can tell you straight up, one of the most impressive things was, like you say, any time it was in the old MR15, a 14-14 game, he was making the call. And the call he would make would play out and he would win the round. And I was like, mate, that is actually, because that's Carrigan-esque, that is one of the most rare but most fucking worth its weight in gold qualities. Because as you say, there's plenty of times your players get you into a situation where it's like two rounds to play. Can you get one T round? The question then becomes, not just do you have the playbook, but do you have the genius call? Everyone knows the famous thing in MR15 was when it's round 28 or 29, you all look to Carrigan. What is he going to come up with now? He's going to figure out the call that will be remembered when you win the tournament as the, the pivotal round. Alexi has that quality in my opinion and right now in a team by the way like I say mm. that gets a lot of close games you fucking need that because I'm with you if you actually look at the team this is why it's both fair and unfair what we're all doing to people like Bit and Emma because the issue is this First of all, if they were ever the players they were before, we don't even need this conversation. We're all loving it. This is another like weird mixed international, like semi super team type. Ooh, interesting. Guy. Like, it'd be like Mouse. You'd have a great caller, a bunch of weapons. Cross, it'd be sick. Like you say, you'd be mixing it up every time you'd be in the semi final. But even if you're not going to say that, if you just look at these three pieces, wonderful, gel. And like CB, those three pieces, I have no problem with whatsoever. Those three pieces all do their job. In mm. fact, GL, I think he sometimes overfrags. Yeah. Like, I don't even think he should be sometimes dropping a 25 bomb or whatever he does. I might not like him as a person, by the way, but I'll never diss people's actual in-game ability if they're good. The problem if your people, like Immer especially, Bit can ride because he has all that success in the past. If you're Immer, here's the issue. It's not that you can't be in this team, but if this team would go to the next level without you, then you shouldn't be. You know what I mean? You should be on OG or Game of Legion again or go and play in fucking bleed with fucking Casada or something. You know, these are the teams that you can go and rediscover your game and maybe you are brilliant because the obvious thing to me I'm questioning is this. I think both Shuhi and Alexi B are great IGLs, but it doesn't, you don't always have the same feel for an IGL. You don't have the same sync up. Maybe with Shuhi he had that because I did think when he played right. in Game League he looked very poised actually. He looked very different to this player who looks lost or questioning himself. He looked like actually that's why I thought this guy was going to be a star him. I thought maybe he is the truth. Like look at the way the guy's playing. Like it's like a fucking mini Nico or something. His, his T side's awesome. I haven't seen that guy in Navi, mate. Even the flashes of the fragging, it's it's always got a fragility to it that scares me. So I have to say on that one, it's like what I say about Huxy. If you're Huxy, it's great to be in G2. The question is, is it great to be in G2 with Huxy if you're Monty and Nico? It's perspective is what we have to ask you. And you have to ask who the Orc is. Just like with G2, you're supposed to win the major. If you're Navi, look, I won't say without simply you're supposed to win the major. But if you look at the team now, like Maniac says, you're only a piece away, maybe. By the way, if you make two changes, we can start talking tomorrow. If you could bring in certain players, this could be a very dynamic squad. Yeah, I'm with you. Like, what about this then? So... Maybe we'll do one last topic. I'll tell you what, pick one team that didn't make the playoffs that we'll talk about. Who would you pick? Ooh, Who's interesting a team to that you? didn't yeah. make the playoffs that we would be interested to talk, talk about. Who would, you, who would you be interested in? To, some storyline, some angle you've got for them. Who are you going to go with? Yeah, okay, let me, let me have a yeah. little looky-looky then. A team that... <sighs> well, I was going to say VP, but no, because of what happened now, like, I don't, I don't want to do that. We've already covered the whole thing. I, I, I would open the wound VP again. In a, in a, we, would <laughs> sure. have, we would have a completely different conversation. Yes. Oh, but there is an interesting one that we can have. You, uh, prior to the major, we did an episode together, and you were relatively hyped on heroic. Yeah. One to three. Oh yes, one that's to a three, banner. Yes. Not making it. Yes. That is what. What is your take? Uh, impressions of heroic? They haven't really lived up to the hype that you were uh, ready yeah. to give them. I mean, first of all, the thing I have to say is this: look at what the actual result. Because remember, they did awesome in the first Swiss. That was great. And by the way, remember, because this major thankfully had a lot of the big names waiting in this like elimination stage. To be fair, the first round of Swiss is actually how it should be. It's not like those bullshit other majors where you have like fears and vitality in the first Swiss. This was the Swiss where if you are Cloud9 and Heroic, you're supposed to farm. You're supposed to farm all these fucking noobs and show you're actually really good. So they did their job completely in the first phase. The issue is, in the second one, what is most damning, Maniac, is just who you played. Bro, you won the BO1 mm. over phase and all If you win that one... I'm supposed to be really confident in my pick that you're going through the playoffs. If I then say you're going to play complexity in a BO1, that's mad winnable. What are you talking about? Then you're going to play VP, 
another winnable game, mate. They could be up and down. And then if I tell you at the end to just get to the 2-2 game, just beat Payne Gaming in a best of three, bro, I have no excuse whatsoever for this. This is actually just unacceptable. But hey, like, their level went so much further down. Like I said, so, if anything, they beat the hardest opponent of the ones they played. Somehow they blew it against the lesser teams and they actually looked mad unconvincing as well. Like, they were having whole maps where you're like, bro, they're not even in this map. Like, what the fuck's going on here? So, I, like... Give me some of your initial impressions, because let's get into this. I do think this is a team worth talking about. That was a team for me that could have been a, a dark horse to be in these playoffs and be again. If they'd have been against the Heroic, maybe now I'd be hyping them up that they could beat them or something, you know. I'm G2, rather. Sorry, I'm, I said Heroic again. If they'd have played a G2, maybe, I, or Navi, maybe I'd said they could win. Yeah, well, I, prior to the major, I think I was ready to, I was ready to give them a fighting chance for like spot number eight at the playoff. You know, the one that now Eternal Fire is having, I was thinking, okay, this if this spot is yes. up for debate and then we're going to give a chance to some uh, some of the lesser established teams, and I think Heroic would have been a pretty passable name for that. I think what really happened to them and what really exposed them is the, the loss against Complexity probably hit them morally more than it should have. And it is it usually comes with the territory of being a new team that yep. is riding a high from event to event where eventually you, you're going to be and I, I want to put this delicately. You are not playing a perfect Counter-Strike. And you were not in Katowice and you were not in the opening stage, even though you were winning, because you obviously didn't have the time to set up your perfect Counter-Strike. You're a brand new roster coming up from all the kind of angles. You're going to need a long time to figure out the Counter-Strike you want to play. But you were riding a high. You were having great results. You were surprising everybody. Your superstar nurse was firing. Tezis was blowing people away from the server, multi-kills on multi-kills. And then suddenly you lost this game against Complexity. You were almost going to be 2-0. You were going to be one best of three away from the playoffs. But then you lost that game. And then you got slapped in the face by VP. And then you kind of lost track of that momentum. And you reverted back to being a little bit more isolated, a bit more individualistic. And then you have some individuals who completely disappeared. Now, I'll put the disclaimer on. Uh, as the Heroic versus Pain game was going on, I was covering a different game Fair at enough. the same time on the broadcast. So I have... Seen, I have rewatched the catastrophe of the 12 0 half on that Mirage. Was insane. Yeah. <laughs> holy hell, was that bad? But it's that I, don't exa I don't think I have a, a proper opinion on that one, but I will say that it is extremely damning. Like, there's, there's nothing I can say to save them from that run. There's, there's, no, there's no excuse to be made. Um, I think it's a, it's a harsh reality check. I personally did not have them in the playoff, but I also didn't expect them to lose 2 0 to Pain and look like they are two classes below. That that one is that one is disappointing. No, there's two components to this. One, as you said, it's exactly what I would have said if I'd have gone on the desk after they'd been eliminated. Here's the first thing I would have said after they lost to Pain. I would have said, Heroic are all going to be waking up in the middle of the night thinking about that OT loss to Complexity until the fucking Shanghai major, boys. Like, because that moment was the moment where you were almost 2 0, and then you were like, and then from then you never even got to a second win. That was it. That, after that, it was all downhill. Right. First of all, I, that is the problem with being a newer squad and a squad that didn't have an existing core is you've got nothing to fall back on when you get mentally broken like that. It's like the VP example. I've always said the underdog, when they don't win the OT game that could have won them the series, it's famous they get blown out in the third map. And if you're the other team, that's what you're even waiting for. You're like, phew, we got past that. Now we can work them. They never looked the same after that. And the seeds were already there though, Maniac, because even in that game, if I ask you, just look at the scoreboard, what name's missing? Where's Nerds? And he had a terrible... I've looked this up now. There are only eight players with a low rating in this Swiss stage, guys. Mm. This was a guy, remember, when we, where his best... We were talking about, like, he was, like, a sleeper, like, top 10 player in the world. He was looking fucking sick, mate. He was, like, the, the engine of this team. So, I mean, as crazy as it is, Nikodos was the one I was criticizing before. He actually ended up playing the best out of everyone. Like, this was a real... Yeah. This is just a collapse, unfortunately. This is also where... That's why, earlier on, if you wonder why we kept framing it and kept going back to, like, but even if I think Spirit are great, and even if Mouse are great, it's so hard to pick the inexperienced players and the teams that haven't been there. This is why, guys. Because Heroic is the best example ever. In the less pressure matches and against worse opponents, everything was normal. They were just dusting them off. Not usual day in the office, no problem. But when they got to the important part where people were like, okay, right, I believe you. You're a good, you're a top 10 team. Show me. It, they had a collapse. By the way, this can happen to a lot of teams at majors. I mean, we've seen great teams collapse at this. So yeah, it's not like yeah, it's yeah. it's not like it's totally implausible. I just think it's sad, is the thing, because for me, like I said, I was never really the true believer in ENTS. 
Even teams like VP, it depends who you're playing. You're, you're conditional for me if you're going to make it. This team, I actually did think, showed me before this tournament a level of play and consistency where I actually thought, they can do it. Like, But the problem is, my first thing I would tell you is I need notes to be my star player. It can't be the ninth <laughs> worst like worst rated I player in the tournament. I, that, we've got nothing then. <laughs> you know, what am I doing then? Yeah, there's no coming back from that. Uh, listen, yes. I'm, there's nothing to save him. I, all, I can, all I can say is that he's given me no reason to think that this was not just a one-off. Oh, sure, I, sure. Looking at his trajectory as a player, I have to imagine that this yes. is just an outlier of a terrible performance. But what is interesting is going to be to follow Heroic from now on and see how they keep on working and or improving or not. Sure. Because I think, again, riding a high at the very beginning of a team is, is relatively easy and comfortable. Now you've just had a slap in your face and you are going to be a little bit in the shadow for a while. You have to rework your play style and all of that. And so if they ever can make it again to a position where I'm ready to talk to them or about them as a top 10 team in the world, that would be, that would be impressive. I would be impressed. For now, all I had seen looked like mostly... Uh, sort of a contextual storm with like a lot of momentum and a, a lot of having fun and also a lot of repressed anger from previous lineups where everyone is kind of happy to play together and having a good time, right? Now, it's like it's like the, the passion of meeting someone new after you've been with someone for many, many years and then you think everything is great in this new one relationship because, oh my God, I finally don't have to deal with all of yes. it. And then the months pass and then reality starts settling in and then you face your own problem again and you're like thinking, oh shit, actually, yeah, this this is something that I had with me. So I do wonder if there's not going to be a little bit of that with Heroic, when once the passion dies down a little, then will they actually want to be partners in life for a longer time? That, that we're going to have to see, because this is the first real little obstacle that they've made on their path. Yeah, I will just obviously say on that one, um, let me think how to phrase this. I would say that this is actually where, well, all right, well, even though I'm aware I'm doing it, I'll still inject myself with the copium. Like, here's why it's okay though, Maniac. Because if they had have fluked it to the top eight, then a la Cloud9, they might go, the roster's totally fine. Stick with this for the next year. <laughs> so, whereas now, I've opened the door. They might still make one roster move, which is all they need to get a bit better. Listen, it's bullshit. It's, 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 that still doesn't in any way excuse what they did here. I know that, but I'm just going to tell myself that because I'm like you. I do also think, I don't think this is like the decision decisive one. They were frauds all along. If anything, I actually just think it got to them. I think absolutely not winning that BO1, cracked their mental, and then a bunch of underdogs took advantage of that. And by the way, well played to those underdogs. Well played to Pain Gaming. Yes. Fucking season advantage of it. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, by the way, so to end, we're just going to say Thorin's picking Team Spirit and Maniac conditionally is picking Vitality with the Major. I'm okay with that. 